Okay, and then we should be, and we're live. So hopefully everybody can hear us all right, um, and then there are no tech glitches. Um, so thank you, Amy, for kind of uh, introducing this this next talk, and I can confirm that it is uh, the dawn of deep tech. And there's a sort of and it's David versus Goliath, which again is a sort of a, a, a bit of a cryptic title. So I, I should probably explain that a little bit more. And yes, by the way, I'm so I'm Maya Palmer, um, innovation editor at Sifted, um, with a big interest in in all things deep tech. Uh, so th this was a good session for me to um, to chair to moderate um and i think the 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 kind of the david and goliath theme so if we kind of expand on that i mean it's it's this idea that with deep tech things this time things might be different right so we've been just talking about this distributed teams and the fact that you can have a tech company everywhere um and i think with deep tech what's really interesting about that is the idea that okay so we've had just had sort of 20 or 30 years of Silicon Valley dominating almost any branch of tech that you can can think of, right? So consumer internet, SaaS software, uh, you know, and um, and gradually, you know, any companies that we had in, in in Europe doing those things have kind of been overtaken. But there's this big hope that with deep tech, you know, this time it's going to be different because you have a, a different set of technologies and a different uh, market dynamic, maybe um, that is going to mean that 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 Europe will kind of regain uh, some foothold in here. And I don't want to make it all about Europe because obviously Choi is here as well. But I think you know, just bringing that balance, it's the idea, I guess, broadly speaking. And if I talk too much about it being in Europe, do kind of jump in and, and stop me from doing that. It's the idea that you know good ideas can happen anywhere and that deep tech can be fostered absolutely anywhere. And it doesn't have to be a sort of Silicon Valley ecosystem thing. So anyway, so that sets sets the tone. Um, and so um, we have got a fantastic panel. Um, I was starting with Michael Jackson, who is uh, you know, a, an investor. Uh, an American, I think, based in but based in Paris long term. Am I right, Michael? Yes, I have a place in. So I'm, uh, I actually have three nationalities, but I have a place in London, a place in Paris, but um, okay. mostly based in Paris. So good international perspective. Yeah. Um, and then we have three other people who are sort of more connected to the government side of things. So uh, Kat Bolognen, who's the director of La French Tech, and who. Uh, looks like exactly the opposite of what you might imagine a French government official to look like, but she assures me oh, is. Maya, I put a blazer for this. <laughs> you, you're, you're a government official masquerading <laughs> as a really hip tech founder, right? Um, what do government officials look like? I don't know, but I just... Navy blue suits. Oh, yeah, the, the French, the functionary <laughs> uniform. So there we go. <laughs> um, and then Gerard Gregg. Um, who is the chief executive of Tech Nation, which, uh, you know, again, a government-backed body, but does all this stuff around ecosystem building for tech entrepreneurs in the UK, um, you know, uh, in, in a variety of ways, everything from tech visas to kind of education programs and, and generally kind of pulling strings behind the scenes to make people connect. Um, and then YC Choi, who's the regional vice president at the Economic Development Board of Singapore. Um, and I'm really excited to, to hear about Singapore because I think it's it, it kind of is one of those areas that is uh, widely acknowledged to have been really at the forefront of trying all the, uh, all the kind of emerging tech um, and providing a, a really good kind of um, springboard i guess for a lot of companies that want to to do things and uh, you know i suppose recently you know in recent years we've seen a lot of that in the fintech side but i think increasingly also on the kind of really science-based stuff so um i think there could be quite a lot of lessons to learn that uh from that um but look we're not here to listen to just me talk so i'd kind of like to bring you guys in with a first question really about you know if this this kind of if we're talking about good ideas um happening anywhere um and it being different with deep tech i mean I'd, I'd just love to hear from all of you what your thoughts are on that is is that really true and are we seeing you know where is kind of europe versus the us versus asia in terms of uh of some of those kind of science-based uh, technologies that we're seeing emerge you know ai uh, quantum computing material science um biotech um, I don't know. I'll, I'll start with, with with you, Michael. I mean, do you think that it's a kind of really a, a more level playing field this time? So I think the whole. I mean, deep tech is this 
kind of fantastic buzzword that's been kind of thrown around a lot recently. It goes back to the 90s when Raytheon was was using the term deep tech back in mid to late 90s, kind of got tossed around at some of the different um, labs coming out of the big corporates. I mean, deep tech is nothing new. I think a lot of people are looking like, oh, deep tech is this new kind of big trendy thing. Deep tech is it's science and engineered back technologies. It's, it's the absolute roots of Silicon Valley, if you really look at it, and going back to even earlier that with Boston, taking it earlier back that to places like Detroit and Cleveland. I mean, deep tech is, it's the roots of, of innovation just because venture, kind of the focus on it the last 20, 30 years has been, has been internet-based startups because I mean, internet at one point in time was deep tech. Um, the roots of it going back to DARPA. So to say that, you know, it's kind of this new thing is a level playing field. Um, there's the elements for it to be a level playing field. I don't know if that's necessarily going to be the case. Um, and we could probably get into that. We could end up spending a whole day kind of talking about this conversation. But um, Europe didn't just kind of fall behind on innovation over the last 20, 30 years. It was you know, they've been having conversations about this since the late 19th century. I mean, if you look at the, the Macmillan Committee in the UK in the 1930s, it was about why was British business falling behind innovation. And one of the byproducts of that was the creation of 3i in 1945. And you get, you know, the best selling, one of the best selling books of the 1960s in France was The American Dilemma, where it was a French author, uh, Schreiber, Servant Schreiber, was talking about the fact that Europe, in terms of innovation, was falling behind. So a whole kind of a roundabout way to say that, you know, deep tech is not this new thing that all of a sudden, you know, it's going to be a starting point for Europe to kind of compete in when you've got the reality is, is that the U.S. and, and China are are substantially far ahead and they've been substantially far ahead for probably quite some time now. Yeah. So again, again, I think going, just just kind of one last point, I just think the whole fan of David versus Goliath assumes some sort of zero sum game. And I don't think. Well, I think techno nationalists might like that. I don't think that's the actual reality. Hmm. No, but that's an interesting thought, and we should come back to that. I mean, I but I'd like to bring sort of maybe Kat in here at this point because if we get into techno nationalism, I mean, I, I feel <laughs> like that there's almost a sort of um, is it fair to say a bit of a sort of panicky feeling in in France? There's certainly been a lot of rhetoric around, you know. Uh, is France going to fall behind? You know, we're going to see a brain drain. Um, I think some people have been saying, you know, with AI, for example, there's already been a brain drain and there's a big push to now not see the same thing happen in other areas like um, quantum computing, for example. So we've seen mm. the big quantum computing strategy being being rolled out and quite a lot of money pledged to it. I mean, is that what, what did you, you know, do you feel that the, the French government is kind of stepping up and is and, and is worried about that? Um, yeah, so maybe if we look at the specific issue of AI, so I don't know if many people know this, but France accounts for almost like a quarter of all of Europe's AI engineers, um, almost all of the big AI centers of any tech comp like major tech company happens to be in France, whether that's Samsung, Google, Facebook, Fujitsu, IBM, all of their AI centers are here because, you know, brain drain or not, the talent is still here and it's still thriving, it's still thriving and it's still growing. Um, and, you know, I think this conversation would have happened very differently, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, because the brain, the brain, I was listening to the previous panel about people, you know, choosing to live in a place where you feel like you're more at home. And actually, the crisis has triggered a massive reverse brain drain, where almost, you know, a lot of our French tech talent came home. Um, and a lot of them are, are back here. So on, on that regard, I think when it comes to talent, well, you know, I mean, that remains to be seen if these are temporary trends or things will evolve moving forward. But, you know, so far we've been pretty optimistic because some of the, some of the changes that, you know, the crisis has brought about when it comes to how people choose where they want to live and how they want to live might actually be um, relatively sustainable. And then, um, yeah, and then are we worried? Uh, I mean, there's some things, of course, that we're worried about. Um, you know, w one thing that I'm personally worried about is not really France, because you know, that's like let's, let's let's be serious here, right? Like, we can, we can be as techno nationalists we want, but we're like we're like the size of California, <laughs> you know, in terms of in terms of economy, in terms of like number of inhabitants and things like that. So I think like if we're going to be very lucid here, you know, there is no there is no direct competition when it comes to France versus China versus the U.S. Like the only way anything is going to happen is if we pull together as Europe. 
Yeah, so there's an interesting point to bring Gerard in because um, Amy in the last session called it the, the bee bomb, but you know, Britain having now struck out on its own. I mean, what happens to Europe-wide, uh, you know, techno, you know, collaboration, and 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 what's the tech nation take on that? Well, I think I think just to Michael's point that you know, deep tech's been around for a while, uh, for over twenty years, and I think what we can say is that the investment in deep tech has seriously accelerated though in the final in the in the sort of final few years. Uh, and I think um, when we look at the, the stats and data in Europe, I think it's done very well. And I don't think we should be surprised necessarily because of the great universities um, that are such hot hubs for the creation of AI talent, uh, as well as like top tier you know, AI lecturers who really know what they're talking about and kind of getting more and more involved in the industry. And actually the UK was the, is the fastest growing in terms of AI um investment in 2020 so and i think that you know if you take you know the great universities in 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 france and i know it's you know france is very well known for its mathematical engineering talent you know here in the uk i'm, I'm sitting within 40 miles of four of the top 10 universities in the world right cambridge oxford ucl and, and imperial who they themselves have spun out quite a lot of ai companies and i think with the combination of private sector getting more and more involved with a lot of international investment, they see Europe as probably undervalued at the moment, which is why it's accelerating so quickly in Europe, right? And I think that's something that, you know, someone was saying that a 28 million pound valued company that has no traction yet, but is a good AI company was kind of quaint in terms of valuation, quaint. Right. I mean, it's not exactly. I mean, it just gives you a sense of how much opportunity there is. I think talent is everywhere, as Kat was saying. You know, I guess opportunity is not, but I think every government is now understanding that entrepreneurship is a real growth engine for local economy, for the local economy and local job growth. Right. So I think governments are now getting involved, um, actively working with the private sector across Europe which doesn't tend to seriously be the case in the US, right? But I can, I completely, you know, I completely agree with Michael, like the US and China are by far ahead and there's no direct competition. However, though, I am so much more excited about how these different constituencies that make up an ecosystem come together because you do need, especially with deep tech companies that need a lot of upfront funding before they can get traction. I think it's good that the state does get involved in some shape or form to help these companies succeed. So I think there is an opportunity there for, for Europe as a whole. And the, you know, the UK you know, is definitely getting involved. So last week we announced a new institute, you know, the, the UK government announced a new science R&D um, organization, a bit like DARPA in the US, and it's 800 million. It's really committing to deep science and technology uh, investment and, and and um, development. So I think these are exciting times and I think there's gonna be a decade of explosion and invention um, with, with this new computational power that you're seeing. Yeah, and we should come back to that sort of what exactly the role of government um, should be. So hold that thought for a minute, but um, would be good to, to bring Choi in at this point as well. Just, so tell us a little bit about where, where you feel kind of Singapore sits and, and, and how you guys position yourself in this these sort of, um, tectonic movements of, of, of you know, the, the giant Asia, US, Europe continuum. Yeah, no, for sure. Thanks for that. And, you know, I, I always smile when I hear, you know, France or California being small countries or state because the uh, city state of Singapore can probably fit into the ring road of uh, Paris or London. So that's how small we are. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's a the, the great question. Right? How do we be competitive in the... Um, uh, deep tech space and how we innovate from there. And I think, you know, our role comes in, I would say, talent, capital, and the last one that hasn't been talked about, which is regulation, right? So we can come back to uh, talent and capital. But I want to talk a little bit about regulation because I think that plays a huge role uh, in the advancement of deep tech. When I saw the title of the uh, uh, webinar, David Go Live, you know, of course, the first one was what you mentioned, Maya, you know, the Valley versus distributed tech hubs in other parts of the world. But I think one thought that came to my mind was definitely big tech versus the consumer, versus the citizen, versus government, yeah, almost, right? Taking into account what's happening in Australia and you know, 
what UK, EU, and US is doing in terms of tech regulation. Um, and I think, you know, I, I agree with Michael that deep tech is not new. I think what is new today is how tech companies have become so big and become platform businesses. So the quote, I, you know, the, the frame I like to say is, you know, we see six C's, the, the latter C, in which tech and deep tech has, have transformed, right? So in content, the first C, Google has transformed it. In community, Facebook and its companies has transformed how we um, interact on the internet. And in commerce, of course, we talk about Amazon and its counterparts around the world. Uh, and of course, they've grown so big, we know because they're platform businesses, the network effect on both sides of the suppliers, consumers, on the collection, curation and use of data. I mean, this is also tech economics because, you know, although the, the upfront development and capital costs are high, the marginal cost of consumer acquisition is almost negligible. And in our belief is that the regulation has not kept up with it. It's been applied retrospectively. Uh, even the new regulation forthcoming has been lagging. I'm personally a lot more optimistic about the next three C's, right, in which I think deep tech would be applied. Capital, basic fintech, AI in it, um, in care, which is technology and drug development in delivery of healthcare, um, in commute, which most of us call, you know, the, the future of mobility. I think these are already established sectors. They are well regulated. The consumer is already protected and there are healthy hurdles to grow. Um, you know, for instance, so you can just take deposits or you push an unapproved drug, uh, like a misinformed post. Um, so, you know, it's a bit of a roundabout way to, to talk about, I think, a bit about the role of government and regulation. So in Singapore, we work with the base of industry to create that environment for such applied deep tech to thrive and almost to set regulatory leadership in the region. And that's our aspiration, right? So we have constrained but progressive regulation to protect the consumers. So for instance, we've been talking about the use of AI in fintech. How can it be fair, ethical, accountable, and transparent? And we work with the financial institutions. We work with the fintechs. We work with industry associations and academia uh, to come up with a framework. Um, we have, but but regulation doesn't have to just be constraining. It's also facilitated. So we've been creating sandboxes uh, in fintech, uh, in health tech, especially even in precision medicine and the application of deep tech in that. So I think I'm more optimistic, I think, about deep tech and the way going forward. And I think the role of government beyond talent and capital is also in regulation because these are the industries that would thrive on regulation. Of course, no company wants to be over-regulated. But I think it's the industry that thrives on regulation because the consumer trust in the products and the services are the value proposition and thus the strong partnership and role of the government comes in. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting, Joe, because, it, you know, and Singapore is definitely known as one of those places where, you know, if you want to test out your your flying car, um, you know, like that you probably will get a, a, a decent reception there. But I just wonder, like, how can you balance being, um, you know, what's too permissive and, and, and can you really create a sort of a sandbox in some of these areas? I mean, ultimately, um, you know, if a fintech fails, I mean, a lot of people lose money, but people don't usually die, right? This won't be the case for, for, for many of these, um, you know, flying yeah. things and, and um, so on. Yeah, you know, absolutely. That's a great question. I think, you know, what you're talking about is this, this, our trial with the uh, UA and the urban air mobility startup, Volocopter, to do a air taxi trial over Marina Bay. So doing that trial and, you know, I think that's one of the example of the sandbox that we create. And it's something that, to be honest, it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not the one month process. It's probably several months, even up to a year, where we really work with the industry or the company to do that. I think beyond that, deliberate process is also a, a, a smart process in which the sandbox have very well defined space and duration so if i take health tech for example um, when we tested out you know the sandbox in telemedicine even precision medicine uh, we have to have a risk mitigation plan in terms of the training of the people that are applying it uh, the monitoring and escal escalation protocols when things don't work um, and beyond that there's also a very clear criteria and process of when you finish the sandbox, do you exit the sandbox or do you mainstream it into the, the mainstream services, right? So I think you're right, it's, it's, it's something that we have to take quite deliberately and having a good process for it with the criteria and, and milestones along the way. Yeah. And staying on the topic of, of regulations for a moment, but, but Kat, because I know that, you know, um, France has been sort of also changing changing laws and, and regulations to make it a lot easier for people in, especially in the deep tech space, to, but, but almost any entrepreneur to, to have an easier time to launch now. 
Um, yeah, I mean, if we want to talk about deep tech specifically, because when we're talking about regulation, you're talking about two things, right? You're talking about creating the right sort of legal framework to allow for experimentation. And then you're also talking later on about making sure that you have solid enough regulators. So you're creating an environment in which there is certainty, right? Like where the rules will not change as you move forward. And so investors know that they can invest. Entrepreneurs know that they can move forward. And that's been like, you know, I, th I think I think for both, that's been a challenge for a lot of different governments. I'd really love to like hear the um, how Singapore approaches it. But we've been so Cedric Oh, who's the uh, director, sorry, who's the uh, minister for digital affairs, has been like a huge proponent of what we call like smart regulation to a certain extent. Um, some of the things that we've been testing out. So one was the creation of this thing called France Experimentation, which basically allows lots of different startups to request the creation of custom-made sandboxes specifically for them. And we're talking about regulatory or legal sandboxes. So we could actually, like, if, if ever regulation is not really clear, like whether we're talking about norms or we're talking about laws or we're talking about, like, you know, things that are more at the level of an executive decree, we can pause that for up to three years uh, while working with the actual regulators that work with them, right? And then um, another thing that we actually just rolled out, which uh, was announced just a couple of weeks ago, really, is that so my team now has sort of like a chief regulation officer to a certain extent who's from this uh, very eminent um, uh, body in France called the Conseil d'État, uh, which you know, has quite a lot of power when it comes to these sort of things. And uh, what we're doing is that we're working with the French Tech 120. So like, I don't know, Troy, I'd love to hear your answer to this because like, we have like 15,000 startups in France. So when you have a lot of incoming for you know, requests on like regulation, things like that. How do you prioritize? And that's, that, that's like a crazy, like mind blowing project management um, uh, um, question. So what we've decided to do is we take uh, the growth stage companies. So we have what we call the French Tech 120, uh, who are essentially you know, the companies that are growing the fastest, have made the most, you know, who have the highest amount of revenue and have raised the most cumulatively. Uh, and we we're working with them sector by sector so that we understand what the general trends are, what we, what we might be missing, not just in terms of general technology, but say like when, when COVID happened, we needed, to be, we needed to move really quickly when it came to regulation for, um, for, for, for online medicine, for example. Um, we needed to move really quickly when it came to making sure that, um, I don't know, silly, like we have this thing in France called Tiki Resto, which is essentially sort of like meal vouchers that you give to um, your employees. And we had to raise the minimum number like we had to nearly double the minimum number to allow employees to be able to sort of like handle all of their food at home, stuff like that. So those are the sort of things that help us. So we keep them as kind of like a Petri dish. But I think eventually regulation at, at the end of it, and I don't know if this has been your experience in your respective companies, your respective countries, is really about changing the relationship that regulators, we're not talking about one regulator, we're talking about multiple types of regulators that work with multiple ministries and multiple administrations. It's about changing fundamentally the relationship that they have with the startups that they work with and putting in the right processes. So not only like, so that you can have the right dialogues happening, but also that decisions are made very, very quickly. Joy, maybe, the, I mean, any advice for, for Kat here? I mean, I, I was intrigued by this question about how do you handle sort of multiple, multiple thousands maybe of sandboxes? No, that's a, that's a great question. I think the, the few aspects to this, right? I think one is having a, a very defined sandbox in each of the areas, right? So in fintech, there is a sandbox to begin with. Uh, in health tech, there's really a sandbox to begin with. That's already a specific criteria and duration and, you know, the, the space in which the, the startup is supposed to operate. So you really have a base sandbox to operate with. Of course, you know, like Ken mentioned, there's, there's a certain amount of customization that needs to happen. And maybe we don't deal with the, maybe this is the, the magic of this, you know, the good thing about being small, we probably don't deal with the number of volumes, uh, you know, that, that France and Paris gets. Um, but yeah, there, there's still a selection criteria that we have to do. And a lot of times I think we have to apply the investor lens, right? And, and perhaps Michael can, can chip in as well. Uh, you know, looking at the team, looking at its, its business model, but more importantly, whether it already has a viable product or POC to play with. Because if you have a sandbox, I mean, the most logical thing is you need to have a viable product or POC to test it out. And I think you just apply some of these uh, criteria, the team, the business model, as well as the POC, you can already, I think, filter out a lot of the, the startups and, and move to the most promising ones.
Yeah. And Gerard, what, do you, what, what are your thoughts on, on um, sandboxes? I mean, you know, the UK is famous for having had a really successful fintech one, but could, could we see, you know, sand, multiple sandboxes coming to the UK as well? Yeah, that's right. I mean, the UK obviously did extremely well after the last financial crisis. I mean, every crisis instigates an entrepreneurial boom. And I think the one for, for the UK and London was definitely fintech. And it now, I think, I think it was second in terms of investment globally for fintech um, and actually 44 percent of european fintech unicorns are actually based in, in the uk and i think a big constituted um, uh, manifestation of that was really the sandbox in the early days to basically allow companies to test uh, and 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 innovate uh, whilst also protecting consumer rights right so um and also just making sure that incumbents really understand what this looks like so they have to change and evolve themselves and i think one other catalyst to that which is kind of related to the ai and deep tech which is open banking it has really kind of accelerated being a massive catalyst for fintech as well and in that regard i think in the in the space of ai back in 2015 the uk government opened a lot of data sets because data is one of the fuels i guess that you need if you're an ai company you need lots and lots of data to understand so that you become a lot better at reinforcing your, so you have those feedback loops within your computational firepower that you have. And so there's a lot of learnings that happened with FinTech in the early days um, that is now being transferred in, to, to AI and deep tech. Um, that we, you know, we set up the AI council to make sure that, you know, uh, you know when you're helping to shape policy, um, you're bringing entrepreneurs alongside the big, the big corporates, uh, as well as the big institutions, the, the scientific institutions that may not necessarily be so used to innovating as quickly as digital technology companies are. And I think um, it's all very well when you have got these sort of strong universities with, um, with very good PhD students and graduates. I think uh, the opportunity uh, is is how do you commercialize that with the use of sandboxes, with the use of ha having open access to open APIs, and and then commercializing and scaling that really quickly um, is the opportunity that we're seeing manifest itself really really well at the moment. <clears throat> Now, Michael, I want to bring you in here because uh, throw in some of the, the the VC perspective, though, because we're at risk of becoming maybe too government focused here. How much does it matter that there is, you know, that there's some of this kind of opening up of, of, of you know, easing of, of regulations in some way and, and also some of the big sums that are being pledged, you know, with spending? Does it? I, mean, I think I mean, every every deep tech category ever has had you know, substantial amounts of government money going into it. Um, you know, you talk about, you know, Gerard was talking about um, ARIA, which is kind of the new British go at a DARPA. And that's been kind of one of the success stories in the, UK, in the US. It's not the UK's first go at a DARPA-like entity. I mean, there was what DARA, which part of that ended up getting spun off in the early 2000s, um, which is now a, prob a publicly traded company. So there is, there's got to be, a, I think it's the question of um, how much government involvement, because if you've got in Europe where you already have universities taking often substantial chunks of the cap table of the companies coming out of the universities, and then on top of that, if you start having government directly investing and they also taking a substantial chunk of the cap table, you might end up with a startup that's got 25% going to the university, 25% going to the government. Um, that could potentially be unattractive for follow-on investors. And I think that's a dangerous game, um, potentially, because you can have the very, the very growth that you're trying to instill and kind of inject into the ecosystem, you could end up just being kind of dampening down. So if you look at most of it, most historically, it's been grants uh, and small business loans, which, which is non-dilutive. It's not, it's not affecting the cap table. So the fact that a lot of European governments are taking dilutive stances that is going to be interesting to follow to see just how much that either positively or negatively impacts follow on capital. Um, and on top of that, when you also have large amount of government LP money in Europe, that also plays into it. So you're going to have, you know, government as GP, government as LP, plus the universities on the cap table. Um, there's always a danger that you're, you know, creating a closed loop ecosystem. Mm. And that is definitely not what they would want to do. 
Um, but you know, you do see that you, you see, you know, government as LPs. I've seen a lot of kind of deep tech investors, people kind of morph into becoming deep tech investors because they see it's a hot topic. So they go out and they raise a bunch of LP money from a government uh, LP. So people that were very generalist tech investors all of a sudden now have a deep tech fund that's maybe affiliated with the university because the because the government LP feels safe with them, even though the overwhelming amount of data from from CalPERS, from Kaufman, et cetera, says that that's not the way to go in terms of, of creating success in, in deep tech investment. So yeah, I do think it's it's potentially problematic, uh, yeah. but at the same point in time, there has to be government, you know, serious government commitment towards kind of fostering a, a deep tech community. Um, the question is just how, you know, what's the best mechanisms for them to do that? Um, yeah. So it's gonna be, uh, that's the tricky one. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to kind of unpack there, really. And I mean, because I, I, I think there are sort of separate problems. I mean, there's there's one, which is the whole sort of university, uh, it, you know, if they're taking a very large stake in, uh, you know, in that startup, and, and if that can have a really uh, chilling effect then on, on that going forward. And I think, Kat, you were saying that, you know, in, in France, it was really difficult, because if you were um you know a publicly funded researcher you were not allowed to spin out your your research oh um well i mean so so france is a little different in the sense that you know it doesn't matter if you're talking about the public investment bank you're talking about universities you're talking about the ministry it's all the same thing right it's all public <laughs> no it's true i mean it does change the the fundamental nature of, of how we work and um Actually, I would uh, encourage the audience to, to check out a report that was actually just written by Sifted um, on the French model uh, called uh, the French Tech Revolution, and in, in which they, they talk about uh, what, I, what they adorably nicknamed the very, very visible hand, um, referring, to, referring to French government. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a different model. I don't know. I don't think it's for, for all countries. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't apply it top down anywhere for sure. Uh, but but it is different. So like you know, what does that mean when uh, a university is or a research center is is government, right? Is public. That means that everybody, all the researchers that work for them, are officially government employees. And when you're a government employee, or when you're also working in the private sector for that matter, you can't be like a full time employee somewhere and then have a side job, right? Or you can't be a full time employee somewhere and then take a stake in a company without having to without making like uh, you know like specific declarations when it comes to deontology and things like that. That's like, that happens like across the board. But what France did is that we actually changed the law specifically for researchers uh, just, uh, just a couple of years ago to allow them to work up to 50% of their time at a startup while maintaining um, their status as researchers and also allowing them to take a stake uh, in a company. Um, you know, that said, like sort of to, to Michael's point on, on this date, I mean, hopefully we're doing this reasonably well, but it's not so much about funding the overall tech ecosystem. Everyone knows that that's quite dangerous. It's a matter of like finding out where are the gaps that the market has left, that if you want to push for a very specific type of model or specific type of growth in your, in your native ecosystem, you just need to go for it. And in our case in France, we have two massive gaps that we've identified. One is really at sort of like the pre-seed seed stage. Uh, when it comes to when it comes to, to startups later on, I mean, when it comes to deep tech startups specifically, and then later on growth, but that's just like, you know, all European startups <laughs> to a certain extent. And, and before that, something that we haven't spoken about as much, because maybe it's, 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 le it's, I think it's definitely much less of an issue um, in the UK is the fact that, you know, it's not like scientists, like all scientists find startups sexy. Like a lot of them think they're a bunch of like, you know, bunch of like, capitalistic cowboys looking for a quick exit and make a lot of money when actually the culture of research t tends to be t towards a lot more like towards impact or academia. So, so there's definitely that part of the pipeline that you need to need to work with as well. So when you look at the government funding, um, just to sort of like talk a little bit about, um, you know, how much we put in or how, how we do it, uh, there are different types. We definitely, it's, you know, we definitely have a lot of like non-dilutive grants um, we also introduced um, a lot of match funds. So a lot of we do for, for deep tech is like usually like match funds where, you know, we so we have this fund, for example, called French Tech Seed, uh, which is a 400 million euro fund where um, uh, any startup that gets tagged by one of our scouts and we have this like whole network of, uh, of deep tech startup scouts. As soon as they raise their first round, we, we follow on auto, like we, we come in automatically up to 250K in convertible notes, but like with no 
no nothing, like no, no due diligence, nothing. We just sort of like uh, go with it regardless of who the investor is. So that's like one tactic. You know, another tactic have been like the innovation competitions, which, you know, turn out like around 30, like 30 million euros in, in grants every year. Another tactic has been funding. Um, so one of our the recent uh, funds that we have is called French Tech Acceleration. We just got 100 million, but it's specifically to fund startup studios, incubators, accelerators, special aid, uh, specialized in deep tech. Um, you know, so I think it's like, I think when, you, when you're working with these things, uh, you, you really need, it's not about like that one product, it's, it's trying your best to do the right models and making sure that you have a whole portfolio of things that are working in harmony with the local VC uh, ecosystem. That said, like, I mean, there aren't a ton, right? Like VCs that are actually specialized in deep tech, we're not quite there. I mean, we're certainly not there yet in France. Um, which, which also explains why, why we're really present. We're, that we're not there yet in terms of technical expertise. Um, yeah. So you could have a lot of VCs that won't necessarily be very good for the startups. Um, and I then we're not there yet in terms of funds. I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, you know, everybody is calling themselves a deep tech uh, VC at the moment, um, but, but not all of them are uh, the same, for sure. Um, I think that, I mean, there's there's an awful lot more. I wish we could kind of dig uh, really deep into some of the, the tech transfer stuff and, and, and things that we didn't get into, but I am kind of conscious that we're coming to the end of the session. So I, I sort of thought what might be fun to end on is if, if I can ask each of you to think of, you know, what's one kind of roadblock that, that you think we, if you could get rid of, you know, um, in, in terms of kind of helping, a, the, you know, the deep tech ecosystem wherever you are, sort of really flourish and and maybe if I, i'll start with you jared uh, if you um you know if you had a yep. push list of, of one thing and you can probably do it actually because you're in a position <laughs> well we're very excited i think next next week we have the budget so we're very excited about what what announcements might come through there but uh just i think on the last point you mentioned about i think look I, some of you may be aware of entrepreneur first i've been around for about eight years in the uk and they just specialize in deep tech and have been going now for a while with you know over 200 investments simply in AI companies. And so there's more and more, I think the European ecosystem as a whole, especially in the UK, is, is very, very used to AI and deep tech more and more. Um, but I think the one thing that I think that perhaps the roadblock is that we've seen a lot of professors and lecturers in universities get, get poached by a lot of deep tech companies. I think what we'd like to see is, 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 is keeping them where they are uh, and to make sure that they kind of uh, uh, teach the next generation of AI engineers and algorithm engineers to come through. I mean, there's such a, I mean, there's no, there's no shortage of capital right now in deep tech in the UK. I think the shortage is really, you know, how do we attract more and more people from around the world to take and take, make the most of this capital that's available right now? Um, as I said, you know, uh, the UK in terms of the rate of growth was the highest in 2020 um, in deep tech investment. So I think that's the one. I think if you have no talent, you have no capital. That's 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 how we see the world. Okay. So a good supply of, of, of talent. Um, Joy, what about you? What would be the one roadblock you'd um, you'd get rid of if you could? No, great conversation. I'm just going to build on that capital point that we spoke about earlier and then move that into the root block, right? I think I think in Singapore, the things we're doing in terms of the capital scene is no different, right? You know, attracting the active and patient capital sources from VCs uh, to family offices, uh, bringing government in. I think, you know, government funds start to behave like institutional VCs as well. You know, the names like Tamasic, SG Innovate, EDBI, specifically focused on deep tech. But they also bring with them the network and expertise to support, you know, expansion in Asia out of Singapore. Uh, but I think, you know, I, I like Michael's point that how, how do we stop this from becoming a closed loop system and which becomes completely inflated, right? And I think the demand side conversation has been sort of missing from this whole um, ecosystem, deep tech ecosystem. Player. When, when I mean demand side, uh, I mean, how do you convert the science and engineering capabilities to a business? How do you find the product market fit? How do you scale the supply chain? I think these are the, the potential blocks, right? As the deep tech startups start to scale. Um, so, you know, the angle we take in Singapore is really using the demand side to try to calibrate the, the growth of the capital as well as the deep tech startups. So, for example, putting on open innovation platforms to match uh, corporate lead demand with the startup and deep tech capabilities. So it plays two roles, right? I think it, it, you know, it plays the role to sort of create the customers for the deep tech startups 
but it's also a sort of a validation for the investors that look actually there's a market for this because there's corporate lead demand that wants these deep tech startup that they can scale and, and find the markets um and i think you know over the past year it was quite natural to move a lot of these open innovation platforms virtual so we aggregate corporate lead demand in asia not just from the corporates but also from public agencies right because if you talk about the national projects in infrastructure in sustainability a lot of deep tech capabilities would be desired um so we couldn't we, we will do that and continue to do that in the years ahead um i think the other sort of demand side it's, it's really about um uh, corporate venturing right so beyond just matching the needs uh or matching the capabilities and the needs of the corporate how do you get corporates uh to spin up ventures from their r d capabilities that's another interesting angle i think um the unfortunate stat is that you know one out of eight corporate ventures is seed versus one in about 500 startups i mean there is an unfair advantage that the corporates lend to the ventures either by a jv or by an eventual acquisition uh, so again we're building up that ecosystem of venture builders and engines uh, having skin in the game you know putting in non-dilutive financial support um, having repayment upon successful milestones and apply across multiple fundraising rounds and we can do that in a sort of a inside out model or even an outside in model where the corporate works uh, with a startup um, but I, I think these are just you know initiatives that we have come up with over the past few years i think you know the, the demand side needs to be um, c considered um, yeah. across all tech ecosystems in the world to to make this a sustainable tech deep yeah. tech ecosystem. Absolutely, I, I I couldn't agree more. I think commercializing this stuff is going to be the, the 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 really key problem we have to crack. But moving on to to Kat, what about you? What would you say would be your key roadblock to eliminate? Um, I think it like it, it's. At least in France, I'd say a lot of it is cultural. Um, so maybe if I could do anything, it would be to you know work with people that go on a, that start a science track really early on, as early as high school or uni, and let them know that yeah, okay, you can become a researcher, but there are also these other possibilities. And you know, joining a startup as a CSO is one, launching your own company is one. Because right now we're not quite there yet, and it drives me crazy, crazy when I see, you know, all of France's amazing statistics when it comes to research and the research center and how powerful it is and all of those things. And then I look at the stats and I'm like, okay, out of the 5.4 billion raised by French startups last year, less than 10% was in, was for deep tech startups. Mm. Yeah. So just getting people used to the idea that, you know, this is not just a, a, a you know, a lab based career, but that, you know, you can become France's next elon musk yeah. yeah yeah definitely and i mean elon musk is a is is an important name because prior to elon musk we just they just didn't have any role models at all like as to yeah. well what does that look like you know scientists that pursue entrepreneurship yeah and it's interesting because we're still talking about elon musk we don't really have a lot of european uh, role models to follow so that's definitely something to fix i would say um but we're almost out of time so going on to mike uh michael uh what what would you what would be on your top of your wish list oh god there's a lot <laughs> um, no, I'm incredibly bullish on European deep tech. I think the key is to make sure that that stays relevant in the long term. So I, I do think there also needs to be. So there's a fascination kind of now that, you know, VC and everything's tech investing is trendy, you know, trendy thing at the moment. So you have government allocating money to get funds up. But the, the, the still fundamental research needs to be more funded in Europe. Um, you know, there's. You know, I know top schools in France that have hiring freezes, like Gerard was saying, you know, you've got companies poaching top talent, universities poaching top professors. Uh, you know, I was talking to the head of one of the top uh, engineering schools in Europe, and he was telling me he runs their PhD program. He was telling me that one of the gauges of how well their PhD program is doing is that the majority of the profs don't end up going to, to stay in Europe. They, they go abroad. And for him, that's a success. And so... The fact that you have, you know, European schools that maybe ha do have funding problems that aren't having the amount of money that they have in the U.S. And um, I, I think that, you know, government playing, trying to play VC kind of gauge that, you know, what's going to be the hot sectors over the next few years. Maybe they'll be successful at maybe not, but they need to invest in in the type of research and technology that's going to be relevant 30 years from now. Um, the U.S. had a fantastic 20th century poaching talent from Europe. I think now you've got the U.S. and China is looking to poach a lot of talent from Europe. 
I know two very large deep tech funds being launched in Europe that have Chinese corporate LP money. Um, I think that's going to become increasingly uh, a, a trend going forward in Europe. And I think they're going to have to be to be aware of that going forward because again, it's now the brain drain can be local. Uh, you know, you can work for a, an Asian or American company from the comfort of your home in, in Europe, but at the end of the day, a lot of that value is going to go to that company abroad. Um, so yeah, I don't know, but there's a lot. I mean, the, you know, the fact yeah. that schools still take a huge chunk of the capital or uh, cap table. I mean, there's all sorts of wish lists that can make this happen because, um, again, getting more funding to schools means they could probably afford to hire better tech transfer people and maybe try to commercialize that tech a bit better. I mean, there's all sorts of kind of cascading effects that go with that. Okay. So, yeah, it seems to be a, p a piece around kind of maybe more long-term thinking about some of those universities. I mean, Europe is, I think, justly very proud of its, you know, educational institutions. And there's definitely like this, this phenomenal science coming from, from all over the place, you know. Uh, it, it's fantastic. So I think on the, on the other side of that, though, I mean, I, I do know there's schools that have hiring freezes and things like that. Because, yeah. you know, the U.S. schools are now hedge funds with schools attached to them. <laughs> yes, um, it's true. So. Yeah, we maybe so so that may be sort of almost like an educational cultural change as well. But we are, um, I'm afraid, well and truly out of time, and I don't want to hold um, up the the next panel, which will be expertly chaired by Orla Brown from uh, who's head of content at Deal Room. So I'm going to hand over to her. I'm going to say goodbye. Uh, to all of you, thank you so much for sharing those insights. I feel like we could have done sort of five more hours and still not even got to the bottom of this, but we've we've made we've scratched the surface. Um, so thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maya. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.